He has um, received his Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Washington State University. Scott's the Engineering Services Technology Director at Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories, also known as SEL. And Scott's a registered professional engineer in six states and holds 20 patents. And then SEL as a company, they specialize in digital products and systems that protect, control, and automate power systems. I think we're going to hand over control to Scott now and uh, let him advance his own slides. Thanks for joining us today, Scott. Appreciate it. My pleasure. How's my audio coming through? Your audio is great. We are seeing your camera, but not your share screen yet. All right, it's coming up now. I think we're good to go. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, one moment. There we go. Looks like it's all in order now. All right, so. At SEL, we make electric power safer, more reliable, and more economical. Economical. That's our mission statement at SEL. Now let's focus on the safer. Safer means protecting the things that are valuable to us, including the human beings, the environment, and the assets. And that's all done with protective relays. They are the primary and the last line of defense in many cases against catastrophic events. So some background, SEL is the dominant supplier of relays throughout North America for reasons as you see here. We're popular because we, uh, we deliver what we promise and we deliver quality. So here's an interesting statement that I'm going to justify with data. This, these protective relays are today's most common microgrid controller. Look at the features you see today in a programmable multifunction relay. It's not just protection. In fact, protection is arguably the, the last thing or the least of the actions it performs. They're commonly used as meters. They have an embedded HMI. They record events, oscillography. We'll talk about that and why. That's very important. And you have embedded logic. You can program this yourself. So how that works, we'll see in a minute. On top of the relays at SEO, we use a, uh, a fully integrated approach in a uh, product uh, uh, we call SEL PowerMax. PowerMax is a fully integrated solution that includes not only the relays as, well, protection and control, but also supplementing that with real-time controllers and cybersecurity equipment, software-defined networking, cybersecurity, and more. A fully integrated control package. We've been doing this for a while. In fact, before microgrids were given the name microgrids, uh, started back in some projects in around 2002. Our focus was heavily in the industrials, oil and gas industries. They they had a serious problem in the industry. Power outages can have catastrophic events. So. Uh, uh, we took that challenge on first, solved it, and then moved on to taking on the challenge of the nation state protection system, sometimes called remedial action or special protection scheme. Turns out the physics of a power system don't change, no matter how big or small they are. And, and so this was an exploration going from difficult to extremely difficult challenges. And by 2014, we had solved those challenges and we were now scaling down and simplifying what we call the PowerMax commercial microgrid solution. And so this is about the time the word microgrid came into vogue. And by 2018, we had now taken on a number of large projects, put them into service and realized there was a product opportunity for a PowerMax solution for mobile uh, hospitals and Ford operating bases and for re uh, disaster recovery. So we did that and immediately found another uh, product uh, opportunity for 
uh, highly resilient grids. The power mask garrison is the latest incarnation, the latest iteration. These family, this family of controllers and of control systems span from kilowatts to gigawatts. Okay, here on the bottom is the log scale of megawatts. Each of these dots is an in-service system. And you can see that how, the, how that we've strategically laid out a different family member of the PowerMax family for each category of size of grid. When you're up in the gigawatts, you're talking nations. When you're down in the kilowatts, you're talking mobile power. When you're in the megawatt, one to 100 megawatt range, you're either garrison, commercial, or industrial. Talk about those differences. Because of our success in the industry, we've been judged uh, as the top performing microgrid control system for five years running by a number of um, uh, parties, independent parties. Here, this is Navigant Research from 2018. And on the Y axis, you see execution. That means the systems work. Okay. Uh, strategy means marketing. Okay, we'll take a hit on marketing, but we will not ever come in second on performance. Here's an example, right off the bat, of what you do with a modern multifunction device. This is the most common electronic device in the distribution and transmission system, is an SCL relay. It's got the intelligence, in this case, to control a, a Tesla power pack. Here's a, there are the, on the right are the four screens that, that um, that appear on the, the display of the relay, depending on the mode you're in. And uh, the screen itself uh, is augmented by the buttons below it. Those buttons are programmable, and the LEDs, we call them target LEDs, uh, uh, those are programmable. And they're programmed as a universal interface, in this case, for inverters. So these relay controls inverters. Turns out, if you wish to have a stable, reliable, resilient grid, the simplest thing you can do is have your protective relays take control of your inverters. You do that and you solve a lot of problems, and I'll show you many here in a few minutes. So inverter-based resources go by many names. If you have a photovoltaic system, you have an inverter. If you have a uh, wind turbine system, type four, you have an inverter. If you have a battery system, you have an inverter. The modern energy and the renewable energy industry depend on inverters to take energy at DC and convert it to AC, direct current to alternating current. However, these inverters are creating significant challenges, challenges that in many cases we can solve with modern microprocessor intelligence distributed throughout the grid, and in some cases yet are unsolved. Uh, it doesn't mean that there isn't a way we can go to an all-renewable system. That is practical, but it is also expensive. You have to be very alert to the fact that inverters are not mature, like the synchronous generators uh, designed by Tesla circa 1908. Okay. So, uh, Nikolai Tesla. Uh, so. Here you see an example of what my teams and myself and many engineers throughout the industry use microprocessor devices for. In this case, the relay is the uh, device connected to current sensors and voltage sensors. Therefore, we can measure frequency, we can measure voltage, we can measure current, power. We are a meter. We're a very high sample rate meter. Also an oscillography recording. Here's an oscillography recording right out of an SEL relay. That's a 700, uh, I think it's a 700G or a 700, yeah, 700G. And there was a job site where multiple DERs were misbehaving. And there was a lot of finger pointing and the integration wasn't going well. And as usual, the answer came out of the relay. The, the relay will be a truth teller. It will tell you who is the true culprit in the room, who's causing this frequency oscillation, and we found it very quickly. 
You just have to use the data recording in it that's been in the relay since the 1980s. Turn on a feature, use a feature that's been there for 30 and 40 years in some cases. Here's another example. Uh, here is, as we know, uh, inverters, well, they're driven by firmware, not by the physics of an air gap in a synchronous generator. As such, uh, there's a lot of harmonic content that can be introduced to your grid by an inverter. And this has created problems, including transformer failures, cable failures, uh, and worse. Okay, so the common question is, where are the harmonics coming from? How much content is there? And are they a problem? This is an interesting screenshot. This is actually, uh, this one's actually not an inverter. This one's actually a generator, small generator, a uh, backup generator parallel to the grid that was producing enormous quantities from our, of harmonics on the order of, well, problematic levels of harmonics, like things were shaking on their mounts and causing inverters to uh, tip over and shut off. Well, it turns out that through a, a, an event, a set of series of event report collections from a relay, we performed a harmonic analysis in Synchrowave Event Software, one of our software packages, and we decoded what was happening on the power system. This is, these are tools available in many cases for free, and they certainly come naturally with the relay. So here you, here you see, we've decoded that the little blue hats, those are the harmonic contents coming from the engine itself, the reciprocating piston engine. You know, pistons go bang one at a time and they create harmonics, and here they are on the power system. Uh, here in purple, you see the harmonics associated with the uh, interwinding of a small, very simple generator. It, um, and so these harmonics interact with inverters. Great example of how intelligence that's distributed that has data recording can help you decode problems, find problems, and uh, uh, and help with your procurement and installation strategies because you don't pay vendors that leave systems like this. Integration is hard. It's the number one reason that microgrids fail. And it's commonly the reason my teams are called in is to fix a problem created by those with less experience or those who didn't know. These are not, it was, it was paraphrased to me recently by a very skilled uh, fellow engineer that if you can do a microgrid well, then you can you can do any mega grid. You can do any power system because microgrids are the ultimate in complexity as power systems go because so many things are different. The inertias are low, the responses are fast, the faults are variable, inverters are well unpredictable, and everything's happening at a time frame that is that is you know, orders of magnitude sometimes faster than the traditional power system. And so this integration is hard. And so the number one tool that I use, the number one tool that most people use that, that I work with uh, is an SEO relay. Well, the relay on every inverter to simplify, and here's a great example, bullet point number two. Uh, put yourself in the shoes of a utility technician. They have a truck full of laptops, full of tools, full of drivers, so full of communication cables, and they have to maintain a fleet of inverters and generators and substation equipment and reclosures. And break. It's an enormous amount of equipment they maintain. And they have, I'll just pick an example in one case, uh, one technician had over a dozen different inverters from different manufacturers of different eras to maintain. And they were black boxes, completely uh, impossible for this person to, to maintain the knowledge needed to be an expert at troubleshooting each of these devices. So they carried around laptops with lots of drivers, with lots of cables to connect to each one and commonly had to call in service. So much, if there's so much as a, you know, a small outage, these inverters would tip over and he'd need help. That's not functional for, that, for, for our world. That is not the way things can work. So what do we do? At SEO, we put a relay on every inverter we abstract that complexity away from the user 
and we provide a simple unified interface here in the relay that looks the same for every manufacturer that has the same interface, the same uh, push buttons that do the same things. We translate this simple interface, this unified interface that an, uh, a technician has to learn once for any number of hundreds of different inverters or generators. So you can see the value is big. Okay, so number one value statement is simplifying the customer's experience. This is, this is the number one reason uh, uh, that, that these relays are put on, on microgrid and, and inverters especially. Integration is very expensive. Engineering labor is at a premium these days. If you have noticed, uh, there's not enough engineers coming through our academic system to support the industries, especially into power. Uh, and so we at SEL are looking for a number of techniques to reduce the labor burden to, to make uh, microgrids come into service on time, on budget, on schedule. Well, and with the quality needed. And so here's one example, uh, is that we've developed a plug and play communication protocol that allows you to add a inverter or a generator to your power system with minimal to no integration. And the primary tool we're using is a protocol called DDS, Data Distribution Services, used by those in the world that put a premium on resiliency for many decades now. Therefore, it's a trusted protocol and a trusted mechanism. And it's a published subscribe type protocol. Here's the way it works. You put a small electronic device, ours is an RTAC, in a generator. And then here in the bottom right is the microbit controller. And then you add the generator. It publishes who it is and what its role can be to the microgrid controller. The microgrid controller automatically then respond, responds back with a request for data and a set point. So that's a far cry from real integration today on almost every other job we see. And, and that, that is because protocols of a prior era were built with them that every bit every Boolean, every real, every data register had to be transcribed and, and you know, programmed or configured into an electronic device uniquely for every job. And that's a lot of labor, and not only a lot of labor and a lot of cost, but it's also a lot of opportunity for error. And so when we add features like data distribution service over the TMS no standard protocol, what we're doing is we're taking the engineer, the human error out of the loop and reducing the error rates and we're increasing quality. That's why we did it. And it is paying off in spades. Another challenge we took on that you can only do with distributed controls that are everywhere, which happens to be a relay, uh, is advanced control strategies. Here's an example of an energy packet controller out of an SEO relay. On the left-hand side, you have two 30-kilowatt generators that were paralleled in the load-sharing algorithm from, the, from their onboard load-sharing control, which really hasn't changed. Even today with digital controllers, they use the same antiquated techniques designed in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And you can see as the engines were paralleled, there was some oscillation. They call it hunting in the industry. And the, the power oscillated until they settled down and the frequency finally settled down. That's the legacy approach. And it, really not necessary. Today we use energy packet state space control techniques out of a relay. Relays are extraordinary load share controllers, by the way, uh, far more powerful than the load share controllers on your typical generator. And these systems have no significant overshoot. They have no PID, so they're not going to have integral windup. There's no tuning. There's no oscillations. It goes right to set point because it knows exactly where to go. Okay. That's getting your physics right. Okay. Here's an example, and a, a really it's a problem statement. How do you know that your grid is working right? Most people don't. How do you know that it's doing and meeting your objective, doing what you asked for and meeting your objectives? You probably don't know, unless you've paid a tremendous amount for a very expensive data historian. And frankly, we saw this challenge and said, wait, 
we have a very low cost opportunity here to, to provide a historian. We call it SyncoWave Operations. Please look into it. It's a lifetime historian for your microgrid or your inverter or your whatever your renewable is. Very low cost, rides on an SEL computer and, get, and collect data for the life of that inverter or that renewable. Here's an example of a job we put into service. The top is the, the cyan color is the total load on a job site. The brown is the imported power from the local utility. The difference is the power generated uh, by uh, batteries and by photovoltaics and by generators on that microgrid. Here you can see a demand shaving operation with real time time synchronized. These, these data samples are not random. They are time synchronized to the millisecond or better in some cases. So we know exactly what these inverters are doing at any one moment. And this is the number one heads up display that, op that, that operations team now use on our jobs. This is the first place you look when you're wondering, is your microgrid working right? And this data all comes from relays because relays are right there in the site. They're in the substation, they're everywhere and they have all the data you need to populate your historian. You don't need meters, you don't need extra CT, you don't need extra computers, and you can save a lot of cost and a lot of complexity using systems like that. Now, inverter-based resources, I'll call them IBR since for IBR is a common name, common acronym. These IBRs create unusual currents, currents being the flow of electrons in the AC, and they create currents that we didn't see before. Generators can't produce this kind of current. It's anomalous current. It's current that is relegated or, or uh, well, that comes from firmware, again, rather than the physics of an electromagnetic interface between a rotor and a stator and a synchronous machine. Here's an example. You see some what we call strong alpha components that make no sense to a protection engineer. A protection engineer would look at this event and scratch his head and be, wait, this can't possibly be true, but it is because an inverter can do some pretty strange things. And the way that we get around them is using a protective relay with very advanced signal data processing to decode them and tell the customer, well, that inverter is okay, that one isn't. And by the way, this is the control strategy you can use to fix the problem you're seeing. Not only the currents are anomalous in their time domain, but in their amplitude. Here's an example in this plot. Uh, on the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is the net sum current produced by the either the IBR on the bottom uh, or, or a generator on the top. These are equally sized distributed energy resources. One is a generator, a synchronous machine on the top, the second on the bottom is an inverter-based resource. An inverter is seriously limited in its ability to produce current because the silicon is not capable of producing the eight times or 10 times uh, currents during a fault that a generator has for the last 100 years. Here you see it, that for a short period of time, uh, uh, limited by what we call a silicon time limit, the silicon can only handle so much current for, for a period of time, at which point the controls, not a, it's a hard limit, after that silicon time limit, they back off and they pull back to a thermal limit. Remember, as an inverter operates, it, it current passes through those conductors and through that silicon, it, and that creates heat. That heat has to go somewhere. So there's always going to be a thermal management system, meaning a block of aluminum, typically with a uh, air-cooled or, or water-cooled jacket, to extract the heat. And it's in this uh, basic phenomenon that you have to extract the heat from a silicon device forces you to limit the current if you wish to stay competitive. If, you're, if, you're, if an inverter manufacturer wishes to sell inverters, they need to go to least cost, which means least aluminum, least thermal capacity. This is the fundamental problem that's driving the protection challenge. The biggest one is right here is that least cost inverters don't produce the level of currents needed to discriminate between a human being that's being electrocuted and normal load. And that's a major problem. That's an 
that's um, that's that goes against uh, all of the philosophies of the last hundred years of protection and control. Does it mean the day's over? No. It means that we have to get very sophisticated with protection to discriminate between uh, life or environmental uh, ending uh, challenges or, and uh, 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 typical load behavior. It means you need sophisticated algorithms in protective relays. Here's another interesting problem that has uh, has become very pronounced in low voltage microgrids, especially. They're familiar with uh, battery systems. They have uh, a number of, it's not just a battery, it's actually many thousands of little batteries, series and parallel together. And at any one time, some of those batteries can be out of service. Not only that, they can have fused, they could have, you know, not only be damaged, a fuse could be out, a contactor could be out, a circuit breaker could be open. In fact, it could be cold outside. All of these phenomena reduce the ability of that battery to produce current. Now, how does that affect AC side? Well, if you have a fault in a, and it has a significant component of power, meaning there's resistance to that fault, that power has to come from somewhere, and it's coming from your battery. Now, reactive power, this is the, uh, sometimes some folks analogize this to, you know, the foam on your beer, but frankly, it's more accurately described as the out-of-phase current re required to magnetize our world. That's the more accurate description of ours. That's IX, and that, on a very high-voltage system, dominates the fault currents. But on low-voltage systems, you very commonly see uh, large amounts of real power being applied to faults. And the reason we know this is because inverters are, are producing it and tripping off on low voltage fault in ways that don't look like a high voltage fault. And in this case, the health of the battery is changing your fault current. Let me say it again. So now AC protection systems, SEO relays, have to adapt to failures of a battery here and there. And it may not mean your inverter's down. It may very well be that just a few batteries are offline. So what we do at SEO is put axions and, and RTACs and, and electronics onto battery systems to provide real-time advisement to protective relays so that we can adapt very quickly to changes in battery health. This is a serious issue. What if, if this doesn't work right, you have only one choice, is that this means, for example, if you have a single a single fault on a low voltage circuit, the moment that fault occurs, the whole power system must go out. Because if you can't safely protect it with a coordinated protection system, then there's only one answer, it's binary. Everybody loses power. Now that's a fragile grid. That's a very definition of a fragile grid. So what this creates is a fragile grid that can be solved using intelligent relays and electronics throughout the power system. That's the only way we found to solve it. Now here's another example. Uh, as you have variable fault currents supplied by batteries and renewables, uh, not only levels, amplitudes, um, but also uh, characteristics in the time domain, uh, those inverters pro uh, won't produce them many times enough current for protective relays to even uh, pick up and trip. So here's an example. Let's say you have a utility connection and it produces, let's say, 20,000 amps of current. Protective relays are coordinated, let's say, on the order of you know, four or 5,000 amps settings with load around 3,000. Utility goes away, and we have to shed some load, and now the inverter on a battery has to feed the load. That's in a typical use case. But perhaps it can only produce 2,000 amps. That is below the set point of, in fact, the relay settings because they were set based upon a utility condition. So we have a contradiction, we have a problem. Because inverters can't produce those levels of currents needed, we need to adapt protection very quickly. Now, uh, there's a lot of schemes that depend on communication, telecommunication, but when they, uh, you require things like fiber optics, uh, uh, microwave stations, um, radios, there's reliability problems. These things, these communication systems just simply aren't as reliable as 
as you need them to be for life safety equipment, life protective relays. Not only that, they're slow. So what can you do? Here's an example. You put a PPR, programmable protective relay, at the inverter, and when the utility goes away, you tell the inverter, shift my frequency. And instantaneously, these very fast inverters will shift the power system frequency, and all the downstream relay relays will see, oh, we're now an island. I will change my protection coordination curves, and within 16 milliseconds, you are back on deck, you never had an outage, and your customers are protected again. This is a very simple answer that protective relays offer you uh, for solving a huge problem. And the relays are already out there. What does this mean? It means now you need relays to replace fuses. You need intelligent relays to, to, reduce, to replace uh, electromechanical devices. This means you need a lot of intelligence and a lot of programmable protective relays. So what's happened? You add renewables, you add batteries. That's great. But guess what? You're going to have to add a lot of relays to make it safe and reliable. There's really no other answer. Okay, here's an interesting phenomenon. Inverter -based inverters are now faster than many protective relays. They have a silicon carbide in inverter system. They modulate at 40 kilohertz, 40,000 decisions a second. That is faster than most relays today. Not all, but most. To have a relay that operates at those speeds is very expensive, and that's a traveling way for you. How do we handle, how do we protect a system where the very, the very systems that are producing the current can trip off faster than the relay can even detect the current? Doesn't work. So how do we universalize inverters so that they can adapt and integrate together on a, on a, on a basis in a microgrid, in a macrogrid, everywhere? Well, uh, what you do is you have inverters uh, become very simple. You take the intelligence out of the inverters and you make them act homogeneously the same everywhere, reducing your overall cost. Because let me tell you, inverters are a lot more expensive than protection devices. And you control them with relays. And you, you dictate the speed at which they move with a protective relay. That relay then controls the time frame at which this power system changes. Now you've solved the problem. Again, it has to do with distributed intelligence. Things that work too fast, you can't see and you can't operate, so you slow it down. Here's an example of how we use uh, SCL programmable protective relays to isolate faults and restore service, well, really without even a loss of service. Here on the bottom on the x-axis is cycles. Now, um, over this entire time frame, 60 cycles is one second. So this is a one second snapshot of an event. The whole transpired event happened in about a third of a second, a blink of an eye. You won't even see this. Here's an example where there was a fault. You can see the current went up and these are, this is the phase A, B and C symmetrical fault current of a three phase to ground fault. Again, this comes from a protective rewrite. Right? The voltage went low. I can tell immediately, like a doctor uh, could see from a cardiogram, I can tell you there's synchronous generators on this system. I can also tell you there's impedance to the fault at some distance away. There's a lot to decode from this, but that's not where we're going. This particular relay happened to be at the point of common coupling to a utility between a microgrid and a utility. This is a 751 relay and programmed to what's called decouple. Uh, via the 1547 ride through requirements and provide protection and provide control and provide load shedding and a whole lot more, all in one box. So here's that same event put into RMS values, much easier for the eye to detect. Here on the top axis is current at the point of coupling. These are the, this is the microgrid back feeding the fault. You can see the current surge, the transient reactants, the generators. Sub, in the subtransit reactant. And then you see over time the current levels off and then eventually extinguishes them. Okay. Um, let's, let's replay this event in the timeline. First, the fault begins. 
And by the way, this, I don't know what this fault is. It could have been a, you know, a truck hitting a pole. It could be a tree. It could be a fire raging under a power line. It doesn't matter. This is about how they all look. The relay, the protective relay, about two-tenths of a second later, 0.2 of a second, before you can blink your eye, says, uh-oh, that's a fault. Time to isolate. So it says trip. It trips a circuit breaker, which has a mechanical opening time. This mechanical opening time, uh, in this case, something less than 100 milliseconds. And you can see the current disappear, extinguish. This, this is good, the breaker open. You can see the voltage restore on the microgrid, your VAB voltage restored. Not exactly the nominal, but it, it gets close. However, the unfortunate point is the frequency still in free fall. This is data all recorded from a relay. And that free fall in frequency means that you have an imminent blackout. The power system is about to shut off. This is your house turning losing power. This is your business about to lose power because a tree fell on a line. How do you stop it from becoming an outage? A protective relay isolates the breaker, but the job isn't done. Because now there's not enough generation, enough inverters to power your home, to power your business. In this case, it was a, uh, a, a large microgrid in the Northeast. At that moment, the microgrid controller, it could have been a relay, in this case it was a small RTAC, detects that the breaker has opened and says, oh, you don't have enough generation to power your road, and I see your frequencies in free, free fall. Therefore, I will eliminate non-priority loads to, to alleviate that overburden and stop this frequency free fall. So it does so in what's called a load shed. This is losing a finger to save a body. This is, this is saving a power system at the cost of losing some pumps. Small, small loss for a huge gain for very low cost. In this case, the loads were interrupted, and look, the frequency recovered. It's a real event. This is what multifunction protection relays do for a living. Sadly, most people don't utilize this capability. But now, with inverters, you have to. This is what the future holds. You need intelligence everywhere. Here's another example. Actually, the same job. You have a utility with a microgrid, and you have a protective relay at 751. That's a typical model that my teams use uh, at the point of common coupling called the PCC. Um, in this case, you have an islanded microgrid. The breaker is open. The breaker is the box. And perhaps this is a you know a power shutdown of your local utility. You're, you're, you put your microgrids running. And you say, hey, I'd, I'd like to get back on the utility grid. It's time to reconnect. In engineer language, we call that a 25. Uh, 25 stands for resynchronization. It means put your manual stick shift in gear and get moving. And how you do that is with a relay. The relay detects the phase angle difference, okay, and detects the voltage amplitude difference across that open breaker takes those measurements and sends them, here depicted by delta V and slip, those are the technical jargon used to describe the difference in movement of phase angle and amplitude, and it dispatches generators, curtails photovoltaics, dispatches batteries, whatever you have on your microgrid, brings things back in alignment so that you can open your clutch and resynchronize to the grid and start to restore power from your utility back to you and turn your generators off. This is called resynchronization. It's been seamless. Here, I've got a video for you. Um, uh, first of all, what you're seeing here, it, you're going to see in the video a microgrid come into synchronization with a utility. And the delta V is the voltage difference in the delta, delta really, capital V, capital lowercase d in Greek. Uh, is the angle, and the rate of change of that angle is the slip, okay? Play this video for you here. Here you see the pink, which is the microgrid, being dispatched by relays right off of my old phone, 
many years ago, uh, dispatching DERs of many types to bring a point of coupling back into synchronization and then close the breaker. We call this a cup of coffee scheme. You grab a cup of coffee, you walk to a relay, you push a button, you sit down. Okay? This does not require the efforts that it did back in the 1950s, requiring technicians and engineers to be on radios and watching synchroscopes and standing by panels and pushing buttons and all that expense doesn't happen anymore. Okay, and I can tell you even inverters don't do this because they require the data coming streaming out of a protective relay for remote synchronization. So, so again, a very important function of it. Go to the next slide. Here's another problem, and, and it in the in the playbook of challenges created by IBRs and inverter-based resources. They are known to be very non-deterministic. Now that word means something to an engineer, and I'll explain. If you have a system that is predictably the same every day, every moment, every second, that's called deterministic. I can determine my future. The stock market is non-deterministic, okay? Deterministic is I can press on the gas pedal and my car moves faster. So the inherent behavior of inverters is non-deterministic many times because their controls are relegated to errors that humans make with firmware, with settings changes. Ask yourself a question. How many times has the inverter manufacturer had to update their firmware on the inverters that you purchase? Every time they change that firmware, there's a possibility of it not working like you originally commissioned, tested, and proved out. There's a very good chance that you've just uh, made obsolete all of the work in the surrounding 10 county area in a protection system and a control system because that inverter might behave differently than originally tested. That's a huge problem and it's happening today because they're non-deterministic, because they're not mature, and they're becoming too complex. How do you fix it? You make inverters simple. You make them all act exactly the same way. You mandate determinism, and you put relays in control. This works. It works every day, all day, and that's how come my teams are the number one provider of microgrids worldwide, because we figured this out, and we know how to make it work. Here's an example. Here's, a, here's an inverter that's misbehaving, the scatter plot on the right. Very strange group line, I must say. On the left is an inverter controlled by a relay. Fully deterministic, fully predictable, fully controlled, and this is what our customers need. Next challenge. There's a lot of custom tuning required when there's this. I'll give you an example. In a single inverter, there can be many more settings than a protective relay, thousands and thousands of configurations. So let me give you some examples. What is the synthetic inertia? What is the time constant of the filter on the synthetic inertia? What is the impedance compensation you're using? What, what are the 200 or 300 different gains for all your cascaded PID loop controls in that inverter? Ouch. That's a lot of places to make a mistake. That complexity is reducing reliability. This is creating a fragile grid. Again, how do you know every time there's a firmware upgrade that it even works like you asked for it or you paid for it to work? You don't know unless you have a relay right there to tell you. Here's an example. We caught this very event with a relay. Here you can see an inverter oscillating, oscillating unacceptably after a firmware upgrade. Not all upgrades are forward progress. And so we use the high fidelity, high speed sampling of the distributed intelligence of multifunction relays to catch the problems, to enforce consistency. Let me give you another point of fact. When you change a protective relay settings in the field, it is required that you test it thoroughly. You bring test kits, you bring technicians, there's entire companies that independently audit and test protective relays. Ask you a question, do you have that testing regimen and those companies in place to test your inverters? Nope. 
too much trust, folks. We can't trust that which we don't control. Trust but verify. We use relays to verify. Okay, another example. In this exploration of how do we get, come to a grid that is inverter-based, renewable, how do we get to that point? This is not an easy question to answer. Uh, we discovered we had the tools we needed for SEL. There's a piece of software we called Synchrowave Operations. Beautiful historian for the life of your inverter-based resource or microgrid. Very low-cost piece of software. We put it on an SEL or a third-party computer, and it collects what's called high-speed time-sampled, time-aligned events called synchrophaser data. This data was intended to, to help us understand the oscillations and the strange phenomena we see in a power system. Aha, sounds like an inverter, sounds like a renewable. So you put synchrowave operation into every substation with its own data historian. You put it into every, we do. In fact, I, I mandate this on every microgrid job we do. We put synchrowave operations as the historian so that when customers call us and say, what just happened? Oh, let's pull open your screen and let's go see. And now suddenly this becomes the primary window into your, into your power system. When a manager walks into any of a number of large facilities we've integrated, I have many examples I'll show you soon, what do they look at? They look at synchrowave operations, and they can see not only the, the phase angle measurements across every synchronization event, the internal controller dispatch, the actual measured power from every DER. In this case, we've got cooling water jackets off some critical generators, and the traffic on the network. Has there been a cyber attack? Was there an event? that occurred simultaneous to a cyber. Here you go, one snapshot. This is called a visor or a, or a display or a single point shopping for your data. Okay, back to the point that I've made several times. Inverters current behaviors aren't the same as your traditional power systems designed by Nikolai Tesla and others back over a hundred years ago. These inverters, don't produce the magnitude or the time sequenced current or voltage behaviors we expect. So, as an example, if you would like, um, and let's take a little thought exercise for a moment, one that really I think is a light bulb moment for us all. If you have an islanded microgrid and you have a large battery sized for your load, we'll, that load is, we'll call it one. That size of load, whatever the units are, we'll call it one. That inverter can produce only one current. It can't produce two. It can't produce three. Wait. To energize a power system, if you don't know this, you will now, you have to produce at least two times current to start a transformer. Transformers have magnetic phenomena that require a surge of current called inrush. Loads either rotating kinetic loads, rotating motors, or, or elect power electronic loads, such as data centers, have a surge in rush as well. Power producing inverters on batteries and other systems that are sized for least cost to win bids do not produce enough current to energize your microgrid. Ouch, you can't start a power system with batteries, but you can with relays. Here's how it works. Number one, the you isolate the inverter by opening circuit breakers and reclosers. It ramps up its voltage, thereby punching through the magnetic inrush of its local little transformer. Then the relays sequentially turn on loads in pieces, one at a time. You don't even need communication between the relays. Here's this plot is actually an example of, of an inverter that wasn't picking up load. In fact, it ramped through it, and this is our discovery aha moment. Oh, this inverter, by the way, one of the best inverters on the market, could not energize the, the, even a small fan on a small load bank, a fraction of the power of this inverter. And here you can see the, 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 the voltage in the top plot went up, and then it collapsed and oscillated. This would mean, and in fact, on the bottom, you can see, I think that's, let's see, I think that's, 
Yeah, frequency and current. Yeah, so the bottom is the current. You can see the surge current, this first lobe of surge current at approximately time 55 seconds. The surge current in red went up as the, uh, as the load turned on. The contactor chattered because the voltage collapsed on the top. And now the load and the inverter were oscillating. This is, a, this is like a, an oscillation of your load, oscillation of your lights. This is a very damaging to electronics. And we've seen inverters destroy themselves in this field. So we use relays to prevent that phenomenon. Okay, I've shown you the problems and many of the solutions we've found. Uh, there are still many in progress, but they're not all solved by any means. Here's some examples, um, and by the way, there's videos of these. I do encourage you to, to visit our YSL website. Uh, our customers um, appreciate it so much that they will do videos for us. Here's a, a great video. Uh, Montclair State University, um, this system paid for itself. This is a PowerMax solution, remember, a PowerMax solution is an integrated solution of relays, microcontrollers, software-defined networks, cybersecurity equipment. <clears throat> all providing a microgrid integrated solution for, for a very large university in New Jersey. They were so delighted, they, they, they wanted to share with you, our customers, and others, um, how that played out for them and how fast this has been paid for itself. So. Uh, the entire country of Georgia is protected by a blackout prevention system, a PowerMax solution. It operates with the same fundamental principles as any microgrid control system. In fact, uses many of the same libraries and code components. It's just that it's spread out over thousands of miles using much larger protective relays and uh, very secure high-speed communication links. Protecting from a nation-state aggressor is what a PowerMax system does on a large scale. This the slide appears to be cut off, however. Uh, this system it is in, the system in service here is a PowerMax protection and control system of the Tengiz Future Growth Project, the single largest oil and gas project in the world, all protected by 100% SCL product and controlled through the microgrid control systems. Here's an old project circa 2008-2010, Presidio, Texas, you can look it up, public information, at the time of very, the largest battery in North America. The inverter was, well, unreliable, and the batteries were fragile. So we used a PowerMax system to true it up. Um, this is a classic case of many microgrid projects. Is uh, You might, you know, jokingly say that protective relays babysit inverters. They babysit photovoltaics. They keep things safe. They make it simple for them. And this was the case here. As we were parallel to North America, and, and if the North American connection fell apart, the relays automatically synchronized the, the same local power system and battery to Mexico. And it automatically transitioned back and forth between those the U.S. and the Mexican grid. Meanwhile, use, using batteries to fill the gap in those transitions and high-speed load shedding and dispatch control from the SEL PowerMax controller. These systems scale up like bricks to build a building. When you put relays everywhere, you have the intelligence, the knowledge, the data collection, and the controls to do any size of job. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Here, this is the most valuable oil field in the world. This is Shaiba, Saudi Arabia. This particular facility has a large number of, and this is entirely islanded out in some very beautiful desert uh, on the south, southeast uh, corner of uh, Saudi Arabia. The oil that comes out of the ground is so valuable and so uh, pure, you can run it directly in a diesel engine without refinement. Not sour in the slightest, perfectly legitimate, and it comes with a little bit of gas, a huge, cash cow for that part of the world. When they decided that their purse strings were, were completely dependent on these sort of facilities, they went sole source with SEL. And so these systems are completely controlled by a PowerMax solution using protective relays from SEL, using communication equipment from SEL, and using controllers. Again, the same technology that we 
cut down for today's small microgrids that might go into small business. When some of the smartest engineers in North America went on to look for the microgrid solution for the MIT campus, uh, they selected SEL PowerMax. A delightful solution that you'll hear more about in the future that really, I call it the battleship solution. It is absolutely the stiffest, most beautifully constructed microgrid I've seen yet in North America. Well done, MIT. And it's all SEL. Uh, here we have an opportunity, we had an opportunity, this was 2017, to compete with all of the microgrid suppliers uh, worldwide. It was an open competition. Uh, 500 participants, approximately, were on the first call. Uh, we won that competition soundly. It wasn't really a horse race. We didn't realize how far ahead of the pack our technology had come. And I attribute this greatly to our protective relays giving a great advantage to do things that any other controller can't do. Okay, so we have this demonstration available. If you'd like a little demonstration in physics, we, can, we, we pull out a whiteboard and we teach. And this demonstration presently is on the East Coast. If you'd like to see it and you'd like to learn more about the physics of how relays and microcontrollers work together to keep these microgrids resilient and keep your inverters online and help you meet your return on investment objectives uh, reliably and safely and make your utility partners happy because they love the CSEL relays. Uh, because they are, they trust SEL for these solutions. Come see the trailer. We'll show you how it works. The delightful demonstration takes about 15 minutes of, of calibration with a small presentation and about a 45 minute demonstration where you yourself can run a power system and, and learn how, how these systems work. With that, uh, uh, I would open the floor for any questions you might have. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity from from, from SEL and my fellow SEL employee owners. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, so much, Scott. Um, we'll now transition into a Q&A section, so I'm going to stop the recording.